Hello YouTubers, and welcome to Novus Talks with me, your host, Novus Corvus. So in this episode, I'm going to be doing a spoiler-free review for Transformers Bumblebee. Now, I was one of the lucky few who got to watch the movie over the weekend for one of the few early screenings that happened. And uh, I was really happy that I got to see it before it came out in cinemas because it just means I'll get to see it many more times. And uh, I gotta say, before watching this movie, I didn't know what to expect, you know, Transformers movies up till now we've known a fair idea of what to expect and, you know, it was just, everything seemed very different from the trailers for this one and I was unprepared whether this would be good or bad, I was so unsure, um, I was re-watching the other Transformers movies during the week just to sort of get rid of that from my mind, if you get what I mean, because you kind of have to go into this movie with a fresh idea, like... Don't be like, oh, this doesn't connect with this part of Bay's movies or whatever. You kind of need a more open mind for this one, because this is an entirely different Transformers movie from the other ones. Um, I was I was meant to record this video yesterday, actually, after I came home watching it, but I was just... I was so, like, stunned after watching the movie that, like, I couldn't even, like, get gather my thoughts together. I was just, like, blown into another dimension. Um... This is the Transformers movie everyone has been waiting for. Not just Michael Bay fans, not just G1 fans, even casual movie viewers. This is THE Transformers movie. It just... It almost gets everything almost so right. It's amazing. We've, this is the sixth movie as well. And five of those previous movies have been from the same director. So it's... It's very strange to finally get a movie that's so different and gives... Everyone knew there was something missing from the previous movies, and everyone knew there was something they wanted to see, but I'm not sure they were fully sure of what it was, but thanks to Travis Knight, we know now what that was. So anyway, about the movie itself. Bumblebee is, uh, of course, set in the 80s. Its designs are harking back more to Generation 1 from the 80s, and the Transformers, the movie, from the 80s. So it's, it's more like that in visual tone. Uh, the movie itself, it plays exactly like an 80s movie. Not just in terms of setting, but like the comedy and the characters and everything. It genuinely feels like an 80s movie. Like this is a movie that fits in with the likes of Herbie and E.T. and Short Circuit. All those kind of movies. This is sort of the same category. Um, so you kind of have an idea of what to expect from going into it. And the character has shocked me in this movie because there's, it's realistic. You have realistic scenes that would happen. I mean, yeah, some of the other Transformers movies had that, but in this, it's like things that actually would happen, things that you'd almost expect to happen to you, and things you can almost relate to in some sense. And uh, the humor is very well toned back. It's you can tell it's scripted this time. It's not improved as the humor in the previous movies has been, and just. The story itself is fresh. I mean, you could kind of tell it was a bit shaky without... It's the first Transformers movie not to have, like, a major plot device in it. So it is a bit shaky, but it does well at establishing its own plot and making it something truly unique. Uh, this movie has so many nostalgia moments that call back not just to the animated movie, but to the original live-action Transformers as well. And there's just so much in this movie that you're just kind of like pointing out and just... Oh, it gives you a lot of goosebumps. And The the intro to this movie, the action sequence on Cybertron, is just mind-blowing. Like, it will literally just blow you away seeing all these characters with their original forms. Some of them with their original voice actors. And it's just... Oh, like, I, I don't even have the words for it. It's just mind-blowing. Smaller, less is more, basically, is what this movie means. Uh, the interaction between characters is proper, near enough to proper. You do get more development, uh, mainly on Bumblebee's behalf, because, of course, he's the main character. But even a bit on um, Charlie Watson, Hayley Steinfeld's character. Is, there's a bit of development there, and she goes from sort of being the relatable teen trying to figure her life out to someone who's caught up in an alien war basically 
and uh, so it's it's fun to follow her along and see what she's going through with this. Um, the, the Decepticons in this movie, there's three of them, well, three main ones, of course, Blitzwing, Dropkick, and Shatter. They're not actually given names in the movie, but, you know, we know their names anyway from trailers and stuff. Actual characters. Shatter and Dropkick have personalities. Dropkick is more easier to define. I would, he is lot. He is like Megatron. Travis Knight was not kidding around. Dropkick is pretty vicious in terms of his attitude toward humans and stuff. And Shatter, the only thing I can really compare her to is Asajj Ventress from Star Wars The Clone Wars because she has a kind of manipulative yet kind of soft toned attitude uh, to her character. And as overall villains, they do leave a lasting impression and they are quite a threat and quite powerful. Now their screen time is not exactly the most screen time for villains in these movies, but the screen time they have, they make use of and they're very memorable. It's just, uh, I wish they had actually done more with the screen time that these characters had. As for Blitzwing, now, he is unfortunately the odd one out here. He is the onslaught of this movie. Let's just put it that way. He even has less screen time, I think. He, I mean, you can still get the idea of his character. I mean, like, two minutes of screen time, he has, like, more character development than we've seen for most of the Decepticons. And we get a better understanding of who he is. Is this Decepticon enforcer and mercenary who's sent to track down B-127, as he's called in this movie. And, um... Uh, I the soundtrack in this movie as well. It's not done by Steve Jablonski, and it's kind of noticeable because I felt the soundtrack was really bad in this movie. I didn't notice it at all. The soundtrack felt absent. It was very weak. But that's not their fault. You know, you can't blame for that. This movie is basically... A once off in terms of let's see what we can do different this time um, but yeah I, I really couldn't remember any of the soundtrack of this movie even when watching the movie I couldn't remember hearing it um, yeah, yeah there's just so much in the lighting there's actual color in this movie as well as much as I love Michael Bay and Michael Bay's Transformers movies the bleak dark and gray that we came used to from the first one, the third, the fourth, and the fifth one just strains and hurts your eyes and here you've colour and more texture and it just makes it so much easier to view and a much more uh, pleasant experience overall. And uh, even, it, I suppose it helps in some ways for you more to identify with Bumblebee when he's looks more yellow than he does bleak grey. Um, now, this is made for almost a third the budget of the other Transformers movies, at least Transformers The Last Night. But you'd never think of it because of like, how stunning the visuals are and how amazing the action is. Like There's very little action, but when there is action, there is action. You will remember it. It is insane. It is crazy. And you would almost think this movie was made for more money than the other ones because of just how like upscaled it is. And uh, overall, like, this movie was just written better as well. Like, I get the idea that they knew what they were doing. Even though we kind of watched from the trailers, everyone was unsure. Is this a prequel? Is this a reboot? And uh, I'll come to that in a minute. This movie was written pretty cleverly in terms of that. And so, it's just... Christina Hodson knew what she was doing when she was writing this movie. And she came out with something that's truly special, really. And... Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what else to say about it. I'm still kind of caught off by it. It's going to take me a while to get over this because after Transformers The Last Night, I was just so exhausted from this that I didn't think I'd enjoy another Transformers movie. And then my reaction to this was what I had wanted to experience in The Last Night. It was, again, I'm, I'm just speechless from that. You know, everyone has stories about how they kind of teared up a bit, like the ending in the movie and stuff. And... I kind of had an idea that maybe going in I would, not that I would think it would, the movie was emotional, but more because it's like the end of the previous movies and the beginning of something new. But I suppose toward the end it kind of was that. I did kind of sit there and I was kind of like, 
I can't believe this is the direction we're going in only now, six movies in. But I'm excited for the future if there is another movie. Because it all depends on whether this movie does well. And I'm pretty sure it will. But we could be waiting a long while, at least three years for the next one. It's not coming 2019, probably not 2020 either. I think they'll take their time thinking what they're going to do. Now, as for the whole reboot scenario, uh, I'm not going to fully answer that because I want you to see the movie yourself. But it's, again, it's written very cleverly. Um, all I will say is that Revenge of the Fallen, Dark of the Moon, Age of Extinction, and The Last Night are like gone. They are not canon anymore. If this is a prequel, if you take this as a prequel, it's just this movie and the first Transformers. If you take it as a reboot, then it's just this one. Because the ending of this movie is set up to a way where whether this is a prequel or reboot will be defined by whatever they do with the next Transformers. Lorenzo de Bonaventura said he doesn't want to do a uh, reboot because they're messy, and I kind of believe him. Because I can see a way that this would work as a prequel. But, again, you don't know. They're definitely going for a visual and a lot of changes. But I think story-wise, it's they're going to keep to what they know. And I think it, it, it works that way, you know. Just by stripping it back to the first Transformers, you have a simpler story to deal with. And just more flexible room. Because you're not tied down by Cybertron's design. You're not tied up down by Bumblebee's official name being... ZB7 or how he lost his voice in the last night this kind of stuff so it just makes it less complicated you don't have King Arthur's knights to um, mess around with so yeah overall this is a movie that delivers fully on character development heartwarming moments crazy action I'll just give you goosebumps nostalgia 80s music full on in this movie and just so many callback moments. There's scenes where you will have you will be pointing like, oh, I recognize that from this other version of Transformers. So yeah, I definitely recommend you need to see this movie. It's nothing like the other movies. It is what it said it was gonna do. It's a perfect unification of both Michael Bay's films and the G1 cartoons. And it's ushering in a new era for these films that you know, Bumblebee kind of sets it up for its own movies to come. It basically does what The Last Night failed to do in terms of setting up for future movies to come. But Bumblebee does it in the sense that it's giving you character development and it's giving you a story that could be 